the SE website, our tagline, a more rational world through civil conversations. That is the tagline of Street Epistemology International, of which I'm the executive director of. That is the end state that, I'm, that we were hoping to get to eventually, one conversation at a time. And it might take multiple conversations with the same people over and over again. All right, I'm joined today by Anthony Magnabosco. Did I do it right? Yeah. Perfect. Oh, good. <laughs> For some reason, the, the name, it didn't just flow off the tongue, and I couldn't quite remember it, but oh, I really like to get people's names correctly. Um, Anthony, you are a practitioner of street epistemology. Would practitioner be a good term? or That is the term that we generally use to explain what it is we're doing. We, we And I like the term, too, because we're always practicing it, and... I don't think you could ever be like perfect at it. So mm -hmm. a practitioner kind of uh, embeds this idea of that you are actually practicing it. But yeah, I can, I, it's something that you conduct as well. And um, I was having this, yeah, yeah. I, I can spend an hour just talking about well, we're going to be, um, because I, I want to get right to the roots of it. I mean, um, I, I looked up the word because I have a vision of what I saw it as being from several years ago, there's a gentleman, Reed Nicewonder, who I was exposed to back in the day when I was hanging out with a group called Mixed Mental Arts and Hunter Motts and others. And somehow Reed Nicewonder traveled into that path and he talked about street epistemology and the idea of conversations with people over tough subjects, but in a polite, thoughtful manner. And I loved that concept. But I want to be specific because I don't know how to describe it. So I looked it up. Okay. Epistemology. Actual definition is the theory of knowledge, especially with regard to its methods, validity, and scope. Epistemology is the investigation of what distinguishes justified belief from opinion. Right. And I don't really like that word because it's not entirely descriptive of what we do in street epistemology. Okay. Okay. Well, that's why I wanted to, isn't that part of street epistemology though, is that we first have to agree on, on language and, and terms. So that way we're, we know what we're discussing. You don't Does have to sense? agree on So when we're doing as street epistemology, we don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to agree with our conversation partner on how they're using words or what constitutes good evidence. We roll with it with them. So if you think woke means this thing, then I'm going to use your definition of that word and we're going to explore it. If you think faith means this thing, we're going to roll with it, even though I might disagree with it. And I'd be fine to share my understanding of those words, but it's not, it's not agreeing. It's understanding for the moment while you're exploring their reasoning. Okay. Well, Taking I think yourself that, out of it. Yeah. I think that's what I'm saying though, is it's first thing the, agreeing on the definition, you know, like for the purposes of this conversation, this is sure. what that means in, in essence. Right, right. Ag agreeing that I understand what you mean by that word so that we can explore your reasoning, why mm -hmm. you think that thing is true, for example, even Perfect. though I might not uh, agree with you with what that word means. It's like a temporary agreement for the purpose of exploring their reasoning. Right. And because if you say, well, that word doesn't even mean that. And so then you're there arguing with your definition. There it goes, and no, but and you're talking past each other. I'm assuming, and that's what that. we're trying to correct for. We we see okay. so many examples of people talking past each other because they disagree with what words mean, or they disagree with what constitutes good reasons. Or let me give you a reason that I think you'll find convincing and change your mind. That's the mm -hmm. default today, and street epistemology is a complete reversal of it, which it's, it's kind of very counterintuitive to people, where you just give people the space to reveal how they're thinking about these words and how they've concluded that their claim is factually true and asking really good, fair questions to understand their reasoning. And that whole process, which is what we call street epistemology, tends to help people gain a better perspective of their own reasoning and reconsider their feelings of confidence in the, the, the truth of their conclusions. Okay, so to rewind back to the beginning, yeah. what would you define the word epistemology so we can 
go with that. Okay, so epistemology does have the meaning of the theory of knowledge or the study of knowledge and that type of thing. In epistemology, what as we define the word in, in the street epistemology community, mm -hmm. or in, more importantly, maybe in the course that we've been working on for the last two years, and we're just on the verge of releasing, we define epistemology as an assessment of the quality of your reasoning. Mm -hmm. How did you determine that that reason that you think that your claim is true is based on? What was the process that you used to evaluate the quality of that reasoning? That's what we have have come to realize that that's what we mean by epistemology. And because we have that meaning of the word and a lot of uh, academics or philosophers, people who are into academic epistemology, there's a whole discipline of that apparently, they're using a completely different definition. So we've actually seen instances where they're perplexed at what the hell we're doing because mm -hmm. we're not, we're not assessing, we're not assessing the truth of the claim when we're doing street epistemology, we're assessing the quality of the methods that your conversation partner used to derive a feeling of confidence that they have a factual claim. So you're, you're measuring perspective in a, with the addition of um, foundation behind their perspective. Foundation behind their perspective. You kind of lost me on that part a little bit. <clears throat> what do you mean by um, that? They, they have an opinion essentially is what you're going for. Uh, they have a, a perspective. Per perspective, yes. opinion, claim, mm -hmm. choose your term. And you're measuring, okay, what is the foundation of that? How did they get to this point? Is there anything underneath it that actually holds it up? Because you may yep, walk away good. disagreeing with the person, but that doesn't mean they don't have a valid concern. Most people do have reasons we call them reasons i think we're talking about reasons here so most okay. people do have reasons or justifications for their feeling of certainty or their feeling of confidence that their fact mm -hmm. claim is true and we the, so they, we a typical question we might ask when somebody you know you know they make a claim the election mm -hmm. was stolen and let's say we define what election means and we define what stolen means because that can mean mm -hmm. anything people on both sides of the political aisle can make that claim and have completely different meanings but then we might ask, well, how, how certain are you that that is actually true on a scale mm -hmm. of, say, from 1 to 10 or 1 to 7 or 0 to 100? And they might self-report a feeling of confidence that they're correct in their position at mm -hmm. an 80. And then, yeah, we now want to get into what's actually bringing them to an 80. And then people will then start proffering reasons to explain why they're 80 percent confident. Well, I saw mm -hmm. it on the news thing, or I, when I was standing in line, I heard people talking about it and there were some shenanigans going behind the, the scenes or what, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. who knows what the hell they're going to say. But uh, we expect that people have reasons for their feelings of confidence, mm -hmm. um, whether or not they're really well thought out reasons or they're just coming up with them on the fly. Mm -hmm. They're, they're giving that to us. Uh, and we don't just say, well, that's a shitty reason. Uh, first, one of the first things we do is we want to like a bad idea that might kill your rapport. It might, <laughs> and it's tough too because sometimes we do hear bad reasons for people's justifications of their levels of confidence, and it's mm -hmm. kind of tempting to want to just say, "Well, that's BS." In fact, there's a lot of discussion in SE circles if we should be revealing our true thoughts about their reasoning at the expense of damaging rapport and preventing true understanding and that type of thing. But any, I'm, I'm digressing. Um, one of the first things that we try to do when we hear a reason back on why somebody might think something is true to X degree of confidence is make sure that it really is a reason. So we might say, uh, now that you've given me a reason why, you, why you're 80% confident that the election was stolen, um, if we work together and you came to realize to your own satisfaction that it is, it is not a good reason what would you do? Would you drop from the 80? Would you stay at an 80? Would you go up? I, I tell, you know, talk me through your, your reasoning. And if somebody says, well, I drop from an 80 to a 60, then we know that we're working with a reason that influences their confidence. If they say, and this is very typical, well, I wouldn't change at all because I've got this other reason that's out there. This is a very useful, um, back and forth because we can actually start isolating the real reasons that are contributing to the person's confidence. Okay, interesting. Now, mm -hmm. when you're going in and you're searching for a fact claim, 
whatever the fact claim is, do you already have an opinion and you're working to direct somebody to your own opinion on that claim? Or are you just flat out talking to them? And, and this is a, to me, significant difference. Oh, yeah. um, like right now, I'm just interviewing you. I don't have an agenda other than I want to learn about what you're doing. I want to get a little bit more detail that and share it with people. I'm not, I'm not of the angle that this is a good thing or bad thing. Personally, I think it's good to have good conversations with people, but I don't have an intention in the end, like to say, mm -hmm. I would like to convince Anthony of X right. and I will ask questions in a manner that will help guide and direct Anthony's you know, thoughts and feelings towards a more acceptable conclusion to me. Does any of that make sense? Totally. And let, let, let me just say, I've been doing interviews for probably 10 years, and it seems like in the last six months, we're finally getting interviews that ask the hard questions. And this hmm. is a very, this is a, it's a challenging question because I do think that there are practitioners, even including myself, where if I meet somebody and they say that they think something is true, and I don't think that it's true, and maybe even further, I've interviewed dozens of other people who give me the similar reasons why they think their thing is true. Mm -hmm. And I know they have poor reasons for it. It is extremely tough to not want to drive to a conclusion that I think they'll find convincing mm -hmm. so that they change their mind or lower their confidence and come to my point of view. I, and I don't know how to completely account for that and set it aside because I think we all have biases. We all have our own positions. We, we've come up with some workarounds. So let, let me throw these out there and you can tell me what you think of them. Um, one of the first things that we try to do is explain what it is we're doing. And, and maybe if you've watched some of my videos, you'll notice that, especially in the later videos, as it became more evident that this could be an issue, we started explaining what we're doing and what the potential outcome could be of a conversation like this. And then earlier in my videos, when somebody would say, well, where do you stand on this claim? I used to say, well, I'll just talk about it at the end of the interview, kicking the can down the road because I didn't want to influence them. So my, my, my thinking was, I think, good, but viewers would, would watch that and say, well, but you're not revealing your position to them and you're hiding it from them. So now these days, I, I will ask them if they want to know my position or if they ask me directly, I will give them a direct answer back. So they know where I stand. Um, now, when, when we're doing street epistemology, we try like heck to not ask leading or loaded questions. I don't think we should be directing somebody to a conclusion, um, even though we, we think that we're right. I, 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 would, I would advise people to not try to do that. Really try to stay within their model and try to understand their reasoning and then end up wherever you ha happen to end up. Um, but I got to say, it is tempting when you think like, oh, if I ask this question, they will probably realize that they don't have a good standing and it might impact their confidence and they might come to my point of view. And then maybe like there, there's two other things that we, we try to do. Um, let's see if I can remember them. Um, one is explaining as you go. So like, so what I'd like to do next is isolate the claim that you're making so that it's not these, because I've heard like five claims as we were talking, not, not you, but like hypothetical conversation. Let's isolate the claim. And then next, I want to get your sense of confidence. And this is, uh, you know, a feeling. And you can, at each st stage as you're walking through their reasoning, you can be just explaining what you're doing, which I think is awesome because I think a, another key part of, of good street epistemology is informed consent where your conversation partner knows what the heck you're up to and you're keeping them apprised along the way. And then other than that, other than that, I don't know what else we can do to minimize for our biases or wanting to drive people to conclusions. Oh, there might be another thing is at the end of the conversation, hopefully they like the technique and tools that you were using and they want to use it on you in return. And that I got to tell you, like <clears throat> if I disagree with somebody, I would want them to use street epistemology back on me, even if they had an intent to bring me to their position. I think if, if street epistemology is done correctly, it almost kind of falls away because you can't do good SE if you're not in your conversation partner's model of reality and how they're thinking about things. So it's a long answer to a short question. And 
it's it's controversial. I, I you know, there, there's posts in the, in the different. We have a street epistemology Discord server that some fans created for for SE, and the most recent question is exactly about that. How do you do you mask your intent? Do you reveal your intent? How do you downplay your own int intent so that you can have a really good true exchange with the person where you're not bringing in your own motivations? I'm wondering if, and this is me speculating with exactly zero preparation on this answer, but I wonder if it's a goal question in terms of what is your goal in the end? It, I would think a good goal is I met a new friend and I, I, as cheesy, as hippie-ish as that sounds, I think if your intent is to just create a harmony between you and that other person and a magical moment, whatever the outcome, whatever the words, that might be a good goal. Harmony is a good goal. And we have a lot of practitioners who I would say that's where they're at. They are they are out there. And so there's, there's all sorts of different people doing this either on the street or just in normal everyday life. But I do think that there's a, there's a whole spectrum of goals that are out there. And one of them could be that I want to make a connection with this person and make a friend or something like that. But, uh, this is probably a good point to mention. We we've written module two, which is why use street epistemology. Mm -hmm. And we broke it up into, into goals that you should pursue when you're doing street epistemology and goals that you could pursue. And just real quickly, the goals that you should pursue, we think are having the goal of understanding the other person mm -hmm. and encouraging them to critically reflect on the quality of their reasoning. And you might remember quality of their reasoning is what we call epistemology. Right. We want to help people. We want to understand the person and we want to help them reflect on how they're reasoning about things. Those are the two core things that we think you should be doing with SE. And as far as goals that you could pursue, you could have the goal of persuading another person to change their mind about something. That absolutely could be a goal. Uh, other goals that you could pursue include improving your own critical thinking skills. And this is awesome because we've we found that when you start learning and doing street epistemology, you tend to become a better critical thinker. And oh, we do have maintain and grow relationships, which might tie into what the goal like we, we, we have that listed as a could goal. Mm -hmm. And then the final one is to help make the world more rational. Um, we're, we think that the more people who are doing this and learning this approach of true understanding and helping people reflect and, and maybe the additional goal of persuading people to change their minds in a, in a cooperative, collaborative manner, it, it, it probably would lead to more flourishing and less suffering around the world. So we, we have... We're pretty optimistic about the potential reach of this approach. Oh, that's awesome. Um, oh, I, as a, a weird example, I have a, a pretty close friend now, Nate the Lawyer. He's a, another YouTuber. And yeah, I watch this stuff. We argue all the time. We, we spend hours on the phone arguing and having fun with each other. But that would be, a, I know that sounds strange, but it's, um, I, I enjoy the um, give and parry, if you will, of our dialogues. And we both influence each other, I feel, in the end, very highly. But the process itself, and, and maybe that's what it is, is that I, I, I appreciate these moments to where you're exploring not only your interlocutor's view, but your own views, because I feel like we have our own views, no matter what. We have our biases. And in that note, have you come away from a conversation changing your own mind? Uh, many times, yeah. Many times my mind isn't changed when somebody is using a, a more aggressive approach like debating or giving facts or even using SE with me. My mind tends to change when I'm exploring their reasons. So I, I might do SE on somebody who thinks gun, guns should be, um, that you don't need to permit anyone that's 18 or older can get a gun. You don't need any training whatsoever. I've met people who have those views and I've moved more towards their position on such things just from talking to them and hearing their reasoning. But like, I wanted to take a step back. When, when you're talking to Nate, you have a relationship with him and probably an understanding that, you, that you're both good faith actors. 
and you've probably built rapport over the years and now you give each other leeway, you know, to a high degree of confidence that he's going to afford you respect and listen to you and not misrepresent you and vice versa. That doesn't tend to happen in most conversations, but what's, what's cool is like street epistemology is so good for meeting, assessing where you need to meet the person. I might run to somebody on the street and we have immediate rapport and trust and, and charitability and curiosity. And I can start throwing facts at them and they can start throwing facts at me and we're not going to experience the detrimental effects that we tend to see. So what you're doing with Nate is, is end state S E that's where we're hoping to get with this, with this method, but the vast majority of the population, and I would dare say some of your own interactions with other people besides Nate, they don't have that grounding. You need to get there first. So street epistemology is like training wheels for conversations so that you can get to the point where you can actually start revealing your facts and not being triggered when you get challenged on them. But most people just aren't there yet. So yeah, you're, what you've described is, is great. That's, that's really what we're hoping to get to ultimately, I think. Yeah. Ultimately I say with Nate, it's argument is sport. <laughs> in a mm -hmm. weird way, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, we're just, we're, we're having fun. I mean, we're both laughing half of the time. That's the key. That's, I, that's the key that it, as long as he, he, or you are not getting triggered. Now, the more sensitive the claim might be like, let's have a, have a discussion with him about racism or, All the time. um, okay, good. So if you're still able to have that, then <laughs> yes. that's, that's even great. I'm trying to push the envelope a little bit to see how, you know, what your, both of your limits are on what on where that conversation might break down here. Here's the awesome thing. Like if you start noticing that your conversation is encountering difficulties, that is the indication that you should be slipping back into street epistemology mode. I think mm -hmm. where you're asking questions to understand, to help them reflect and, and also to pr improve your own understanding of their view. Oh, sure. Um, and then there's other terms like steel manning and, and things like that, like trying to, interpret their position in the strongest way possible. Um, and I, that's a Sam Harris term, but I appreciate that. So to jump back a little bit, let's go into some history. Street epistemology, you know, just looking it up, is somehow tied to or attributed to Peter Boghossian of an early book he wrote and it seems to be from the atheist community. And so when I oh, was yeah. looking this up, um, there was the views that is about turning people into atheists as a technique. Now, that's probably a broad brush and not necessarily fair, but that does lead into, you know, some of the early questions. If, if somebody going into it is of a mindset that, an atheist, which I would argue is a fundamentalist, the same as somebody in Islam, because they're making a claim. Again, it's a truth claim. You know, there is one God. That's one claim. There is no God. That's a claim. Both are definitive claims. I'm kind of more of the agnostic mindset of, I don't know. But I worry about, and that's why I ask the questions, if you're going into it with this atheistic tinge or idea, isn't that a form of evangelism or fundamentalism in of itself? Mm. Okay. So just to, just to take a quick step back about the definitions, um, I would define myself as an agnostic atheist. So I don't know that there's no God. Mm -hmm. um, I just believe that there's not one. I'm not saying that I know there's no God, which is the term that is often attributed to an atheist. But regardless, the book that started street epistemology is called a manual for creating atheists. And the author said, Hey, if you use this approach with theists and you explore their reasoning, um, you're likely going to get down to their main epistemology, which is faith. Mm -hmm. And we all know how unreliable faith is. So mm -hmm. go out into the streets and start talking to those believers and you'll start making a difference from an atheistic perspective. And as an atheist activist myself, that was very appealing to me. That that broke through the noise in atheist circles like, wow, because, well, why, you know, I was arguing with theists and giving them facts and showing them how silly their, their holy books were. Didn't work. Bounced off of them. Wasn't effective. They no longer wanted to talk with me, for example. And I'm sure we can all kind of relate to that when you give facts, people 
tend to check out. So I was excited that there might be a better approach in talking with God believers about why they thought God was real. Mm -hmm. And then I started, then I grabbed my camera and I went down to the Alamo here in San Antonio, Texas to talk to the street preachers. Cause I, th I thought, well, if this technique works, I'm going to use it with the most dug in people. Um, but that's just to be clear. I didn't, even when I set off back in 2013 to start recording these talks, I wasn't under the impression that I knew there was no God. I, mm. I'm open-minded about it. And I would say most atheists are. There are some atheists who would say they're Gnostic atheists. They know there's no God. But no matter. But the point is, when I started flagging people down to talk with me so that I can practice street epistemology, I was running into people who didn't even want to talk about God. They wanted to talk about some other topic mm -hmm. like um, karma or ghost or politics, or maybe they were even atheists. And then I was like, oh, now what do I do? And then the, the, the budding street epistemology community at that time was like, well, let's just use this approach on those claims too. You know, it's like sort of like dawned on us. Oh yeah, we can use this for all sorts of claims, which is what we did. So no, historically, gonna, I don't want to interrupt, but I'll lose track of it. Please. Was some of this spreading of the definition or shifting of the goals maybe tied into the ever growing woke society that I would argue no. has become a religion? Okay. Or is this prior um, to that? So I think it's prior to that. I would say I would put it around 2015 where or maybe even 2014 you, you can look at i have i have a playlist on my youtube channel that are grouped by year now um look at the topics that are being discussed we're not usually discussing god topics it's more about supernatural stuff and then it shifted to more grounded uh things like politics and social issues then was probably at the tail end of that so no it wasn't a response to uh, a growing concern about social justice or wokeism or anything like that it was only, I would say, maybe since like maybe 2019, where people started saying, oh, we can explore social claims with this and we can talk to all these social justice warriors or people who want to shut down free speech or people who want to ban books or drag shows at libraries. That was more of a, a later development. It, it just, but I think it kind of speaks to the versatility of SE that, like, okay, well, there's a whole new set of topics apparently coming out. Let's start exploring that. Uh, there's a playlist on the streetepistemology.com website where we have all the latest releases. In fact, this video, this your, this interview will probably end up in there. Anything related to street epistemology ends up in that playlist and just skim through it and look at all the different topics that are out there. It's gone way, way far beyond um, the gods. Yeah, well, like I watched um, an interview, which I, I enjoyed with uh, Austin, I believe his name was. Um, I think it was oh, Austin wow, and old. Austin. Well, I don't I like to go to the newest thing. I, I don't like going, or, no, I don't know if it was Austin. Anyway, it was, it might've been before Austin, I had to. but it was a, a, um, a black gentleman who was, and you were talking about racism and. Oh, right. Yeah. I did talk to him about racism. There's another guy. I have two videos where we talk about God, but uh, it's by the same name. I, it Austin. might be, and it might've been that I saw the first one and I just got interested when you were talking to him, Hey, I just had somebody here and we were talking about if racism is real, you know, whatever. Um, if, you know, if uh, minorities could be racist, I think was the theme right. of it. And which is a topic he brought up. So mm -hmm. that, that's that. another little twist is that we tend to like, we tend to not go out with a specific agenda or topic in mind. If we're doing it on the street, we usually invite people. Well, number one, we explain what we're doing and then invite them to pick a claim that they think is important and they act out on. And in that, and yes, he did raise that one. So I'm like, okay, I guess we're talking about racism here. Right, which is great, by the way. Uh, I, I wish people would talk about it more. Um, it's a useful topic. I talk about it with Nate all the time. But hearing that, when you say when we go out there, we don't go out there with that intent. So I guess my question is, what is the motivation of a street epistemology? or epistemologist. I mean, is it, is this your career now and this is how you derive an income or is it just a, I want to walk out and talk to people I just want oh. to know why. why, why are you doing it? What's the point? Yeah. Okay. Lots of questions there. Um, it varies from person to person. And there's also the, the most vivid, ex or the most visible examples of street epistemology are the man on the street. And it's usually a man mm -hmm. um, flagging down people to talk about a particular claim. 
Mm -hmm. And the motivation of those people could be anything. They, maybe they do, maybe they monetize their YouTube channel and they're doing it for an income. Mm -hmm. Um, in the case of me, I didn't monetize my channel until after we started the nonprofit. And then I just, anything that is monetized goes right to the nonprofit organization. Um, my intent when I was going out there was to get good examples to show me using street epistemology so that I can promote it and propagate it around the world. Mm -hmm. That was primarily it. It wasn't to create a whole bunch of atheists or to, um, change people to my point of view. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't like if that happened, it would be okay. I guess, you know, that, that that's nice. Like they came to realize that they don't have good standing there for their position and they lower their confidence and it just so happens to be close to my position. But yeah, generally I mean, my whole motivation was to, sh to show if this works mm -hmm. and what's happening in these conversations at, at a psychological level. I wanted to have examples to show people so that we could critique it and tear it apart and get better at it. And there's dozens of people who are doing this. And there's one fellow who's going around from city to city right now through the country and meeting up with other people who do the street version of this. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we think that we, it's hard to explain what street epistemology is. It's much better to demonstrate it. So sure. the best, the best we can do is invite people to talk about it in, you know, over video or on the street, upload them to YouTube and hopefully inspire people to take the course that's going to be coming out or join one of the SE communities or give it a try on their own. The next time their, their, their kids maybe think that there's a monster under, under the bed. There's a pragmatic, useful application of the tool that we want to propagate. And video seems to be one of the best ways to do it. So I'm going to make a presumption and correct me if I'm wrong on it. Is the goal then to change how society interacts with each other by introducing a new set of tools that will hopefully spread like a virus? I would say that that's pretty good. Uh, we've described it as helping to make the world more rational. There's a lot of irrationality in the world. Um, we're talking past each other. We're, we're demeaning the other side and coming up, you know, we're, we're knocking down straw man arguments that the other side is not even making in many cases. And we're falling for a lot of things. And especially in light of misinformation and disinformation, it's a real problem. So we think that, yeah, through these, through these one-off conversations, and maybe that this is the only way to do it. It's just exponential growth over the years, slowly, slowly, slowly propagating it out. That might, that might be, there's other ways we can speed it up, I think, but I, th I think that's the end result. Um, we have on the SE website, our tagline, a more rational world through civil conversations. That is the tagline of Street Epistemology International, of which I'm the executive director of. That is the end state that I'm, that we were hoping to get to eventually, one conversation at a time. And it might take multiple conversations with the same people over and over again. But yeah, we are, I would say that that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's interesting. So that's the goal of that. But the actual practice of it in the day. Now, I'm going to project myself again. Like right now, I'm talking to you. My end goal is this conversation. That's actually the satisfaction that I'm getting out of it, if that makes sense. I, I'll get hopefully side benefits, put it up on YouTube. Some people might watch it. Maybe I'll get some ad revenue, whatever. But I actually am coming into it with the idea of you do this thing. Why do you do this thing? Um, what is that about? Now, is that something similar or is yours again more on getting the method and being contagious? So even when you're talking to somebody and extracting it out, you're hoping that the exposure to the technique may sink in and maybe a little piece of it will go with them when they interact with others. So the individual practitioner has their own goals and it might be, I want to talk with my uncle who's sending money off every month to a psychic and he's broke and, and I'm worried about him being taken advantage of. So they might have that immediate motiv motivation of helping their uncle take another look at his reasoning so that maybe he'll reconsider what it is he's doing. Um, there's also the motivation of me, Anthony, as a YouTube content creator, which was to go out and get examples and put them on my YouTube channel to show how SE works and some of the flaws and, and, you know, critiquing myself in order, in order to self-improve. But then there's also goals of the nonprofit organization that we have. 
which is to, is to develop tools to teach people how to do this and propagate the method out. So I would say the goal of the organization, organization of propagating SE out happens to coincide with my personal goal of wanting to propagate the tool out. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the founders of the org, so I would imagine it wouldn't deviate too much. Um, but the individual practitioner might have a completely, they may not have nearly as global of a goal. They might have more of an immediate goal. I want to help my mom. I want to help myself. Um, in fact, we find we tend to find that people who, who pick up SE tools, uh, they they improve themselves. They become a lot less triggered when they encounter topics that they disagree with. So personal development is a completely untapped benefit of this approach that we're not even really uh, hitting on that much. So the goals can wildly vary, and there's there's tiers. Mm -hmm. Well, that that makes sense about helping themselves because. I have a personal philosophy that we can't change the world. We can only change how we interact with the world. And through our shaping ourselves and the way we interact, perhaps it will change those around us, perhaps it won't. But I can't just go into somebody's mind and do something. I can't just do that. The only person I can change is myself and how I act toward them. And it seems to me that you're given a set of tools that are saying, try acting in this manner, following these guidelines. And I'm gonna say rules, just guidelines or suggestions. Steps, right. mm -hmm. And perhaps with this, you will be able to have better communication. I'll just leave it at better communication. Does that make sense? It does, but I think you might be a little short-sighted. Like you're recording these these interviews, you're putting them mm -hmm. on your, your your YouTube channel and podcast, and you you've you've revealed earlier how you're able to have good conversations with Nate the lawyer about difficult topics. Mm -hmm. I would imagine people are listening and watching that, and you are impacting them, whether you, whether you, whether that's your goal or not. Mm -hmm. You are reaching people in probably a positive way and, and introducing ideas to them that they probably didn't realize that they were going to be getting. Um, so even though that wasn't your goal. No, that is, very that likely is but I, I, what I'm saying is I can't just tell somebody do this. All I can do is act in oh, a certain manner and maybe that's true. Maybe that yeah, maybe that's right. So like, yeah, I understand. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm trying to just show by example mm -hmm. and then leave it up to the viewer to decide what they want to do with it. That's now there true. might be a time in a video where like, I might say like maybe I had a really good talk and I turned to the camera and say, folks, please look into street epistemology. This seems like it might be the solution to fixing all of our ills. <laughs> so that's sometimes I do slip into sort of preacher mode because I'm excited. If I'm advocating or preaching for anything, it's not atheism. It's civil conversation to explore the quality of people's reasoning because that is the way that we get out of this mess. I, I don't see any other solution out of this mess other than war than doing this type of approach unless you have a really good relationship with your conversation partner like you right you seem to have with yours well but one of the, the powers of what you're doing i think can be that you're strangers there are times that we can let down our guard because there's no baggage there's no history we don't know each other and we're now at ground zero and completely in the present and that sometimes is easier, especially when you get into um, a held belief or thought or whatever, because you don't have to worry about, well, you know, I'm not being consistent with what I said three weeks ago at dinner or, or what have you. There's it's clean slate and you're just talking, yeah. you know, at, at face value. And this is what you see today. This is what I see. And here we go. Yes. And. and I've often reflected on that and I've, I've noticed that even in my own life, it's harder for me to use street epistemology with family and friends who know me and they have, we have history and maybe even some baggage, unresolved baggage. It's harder to do it with, with friends and family and loved ones. And I have an article, maybe I can give you the link afterwards. It's how to use street epistemology with family and friends. I think that's what I called it. Yeah. There's something about just walking up to, you know, to a stranger where you don't have all those trappings all that history. Now you don't have trust with a stranger, but we tend to afford strangers a, a lot of leeway, which might be why these conversations on YouTube tend to land better. But I think you can make adjustments to use SE with family and friends. 
but they're going to immediately notice that something's different about the way it's that a technique and they feel a technique they feel a manipulation yeah. that that's the, yes. I think the issue is it feels mm -hmm. like a manipulation to some people so you have to be very careful to and maybe that's where your transparency comes in and you say i am doing this now for this purpose so it doesn't feel like a manipulation it's a little more blunt force like no i am doing this technique can we talk about my this? channel yeah. I know there, I've got a video on my channel where a guy walks up to me after having attempted to use street epistemology with his wife, who is teaching their kids that the earth is 6,000 years old, that type mm -hmm. of stuff. And it was exactly that his wife accused him of manipulation. So there's two, he, he comes back up two more times and we talk about it. So it's that, that series of videos is on my channel and that's a real challenge. So yes, revealing what you're doing at the start, which is not what he did. I mm -hmm. think would have probably alleviated a lot of things like finding a time like do you mind if i just ask you a few questions about why you think we should be teaching our kids this mm -hmm. now a question like that could immediately raise defenses yeah it's hard to in households yeah. it's so hard i don't know like that's one of the biggest challenges of street epistemology is figuring out how to modify it for family and friends well maybe the technique that i was you were different in that interview i can't remember his name about the racism because you agreed with the guy Austin. It was Austin. Austin. Yeah. Okay. Um, and ironically in Austin, Austin and Austin, which I thought was funny. Well, it was San Antonio. Texas. Oh, it was. Okay. It moved. Um, anyway, you agreed with them. So then you took it from the approach of, well, how do you deal with other people? Could that be a methodology to do this? Like, Hey, can we talk about this technique? Now in this technique, this question might be asked, what, uh, what would you think about that? I don't I know love if that it. makes I think sense. That's good. No, it to totally makes sense. Going abstract and not even talking about a specific claim is probably one of the best adjustments you can do if you want to use, if you want to start talking about quality of reasoning of people's methodologies for determining that their reasons are solid for basing their confidence on. Whew. Going meta and taking a step back and just talking about talking about another person, like you don't have to make it up. Like I was at work the other day and my coworker was going on and on about the election being stolen. And, you know, I was thinking about asking her this, what do you think about that question? You, you could sort of ex abstractly you know, or obliquely come at it that way. There's also a really great street epistemology. It's called the street epistemology survey, but it's not a survey about street epistemology. It's a dozen, uh, two dozen questions that are meant to elicit curiosity about how you reason about things so you could if you wanted to you can pull it up and have your whole your whole family could be doing it real time on their on their devices and you could be seeing if they strongly agree or strongly disagree that truth is objective or that we're sharing the same reality or that that uh the more people who believe something the more likely it is to be true we we disagree on some of these fundamental basics of how we reason about things that just talking about that where you're not bringing up the sensitive topic could be a really good entry point in for family and friends. Yeah. You know what? You should have shared that with Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris on their two hour argument about what is truth. It's legendary. It's have you ever seen the tech test? The tech 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 test that we do? No. So, uh, if I ever had an opportunity to sit down with, uh, if, if Sam knew about the Tic Tac test, it probably would have been helpful. But we, if, if we ever detect that somebody is thinking that truth is subjective and what I mean by that, they might say, well, the more people who believe it, it's true. Or if I just believe it strongly enough, I can make it true. Mm -hmm. Or it's true for me. Or here's another one. There's a, there's a series on my channel with a woman named Vanessa. The longer an aggrieved culture believes something, the more we should accept it as true. So she was saying something like, there's these Kachina, um, there's these Kachina dolls that are in museums, mm -hmm. but the Kachina culture thinks that those are their ancestors. And because that was an aggrieved culture that was, that was colonized by the white people, they really are the ancestors. They're not dolls. They really are ancestors because the, the oldest narrative wins. When you encounter somebody who's thinking in, about truth subjectively, don't even start talking about their claim anymore. You need to you need to investigate with them how they're viewing truth, mm -hmm. uh, because if they think truth is doesn't really matter, or that if you just think it's strong enough, then 
um, evidence no longer matters. And now what do you do? So, so yes. So to go back to your example, if the Tic Tac test, um, if we, if we encounter this type of hiccup in a conversation, we tend to, to stop investigating, getting the claim and getting down to truth. And we might say, so I have this box of candies here. Um, would you agree that the total number of pieces within must either be even or odd and it cannot simultaneously be both? Hmm. And about 75%, well, 25% of people will say, I think it's even in there or odd. They, they completely missed the thought experiment and they, mm -hmm. they, they are confused. But once they understand it, I would say a third of the people will say, well, no, it, if somebody were to walk by um, and say that there's an odd number in there and you and I counted them and we, we could demonstrate to ourselves that there was an even number in there. If the odd, if the person who's walking by who says that the total number is odd, if they say, well, it's my truth, mm -hmm. my conversation partner would say well, they're right. They're just as right as us by saying that it's odd as we are saying that it's even. And I would suspect Jordan might fall on that line. I'd really be curious to see how he would answer the Tic Tac test because it's usually an indic indication that people are thinking in subjective terms and pragmatic uh, in, in a pragmatic type of way. Yeah, it could be. And I know he did follow up on it. He talked about the if you fire an arrow and the arrow strikes, it lands true. So that threw kind of a wrench into it as well, because true could be a path. Um, so it's like, okay, great. We picked as another a, noun. So we got to agree. Which, to a, right. As opposed to a destination point. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, I remember watching or listening to that podcast and just, I was painting my, my daughter's room at the time. And I just, the, the whole time I was painting and listening to it. And I was just thinking, this is, this is the challenge of our day. It's people who, who are insistent that truth is subjective and it's on equal footing with objective truth. Mm -hmm. Well, and the problem and just is overcoming that, maybe that step would... back and say truth or fact. Yeah. Because yeah. That, that, uh, that would be the first thing I would consider is can mm -hmm. we divorce the two? Because, yes. you know, for example, pain is truth. It's automatically subjective. If I tell you I'm in pain, you can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't know it. But that doesn't mean that my pain is a lie. So it's hard to prove the fact, but it is my my truth. Now, I also despise the term my truth because usually my truth is my opinion. And that's a that's a a hard one again. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Just shifting the word from truth to true gets you a little bit closer past the, the misunderstanding. Mm hmm. But it's funny, like truth is one of those suitcase words that you definitely have to unpack if you encounter it, just like a word like faith or elections or stolen. You'll encounter words like that when you're when you're talking with people about these claims. And it sounds like you're a communicator. You talk with people all the time. Uh, I'm probably not telling you anything new. But the second you, you stumble across a word where you think that you're talking past the other person, you have to stop and investigate it. And true or truth is one of the biggest ones. In fact, we're carving out a specific portion of our course where we're talking about the identification and clarification of the claim that we're carving out a place to put in a discussion about truth uh, because that is that is a claim in itself if you you're claiming that truth is subjective mm -hmm. and you have to explore that claim before you can get to any of the other ones ideally otherwise you're going to just have frustration and misunderstanding as is that particular interview or episode it is it, it is painful to listen to. Now, to wrap things up, I try to always ask this question, and it's an odd one, but what is the one question I should have asked you, but I neglected to? Ooh. Um, a good question that you could have asked me is, what is... What, what do you think is the impediment to popularizing street epistemology? How about that? Sounds perfect. So what is the okay. impediment for? I don't know. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, on this day. No. <laughs> well, so it, it, uh, it has a lot of baggage and we hit on some of them. The, the history with atheism is, is, a, is a baggage point, right? Somebody might want, be interested because they watched the video of a discussion about racism and it was about street epistemology. 
And then they pull up a video and they see, oh, this came from a book about atheists and they check out. Mm -hmm. Or they pull up one of the most recent videos where um, the person facilitating the conversation, it's obvious that they're biased, but they're not revealing their bias to their conversation partner or partners. And then it comes across as sneaky or disingenuous. And gosh, there's probably a dozen more. Like it's, it's, it's a cumbersome name, a ep street epistemology. It gives the impression that you do it on the street exclusively. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. And it gives the impression that it's this academic form of epistemology or philosophy, which it's not the case. It's more psychologically based. So we have, we have a whole bunch of hurdles. The other thing is, I don't think that there's necessarily an incentive for governments or top-down structures to want to propagate it because it might actually be risky to them at the top. So we might have to make it a grassroots thing that just catches on. Do you want on. them to propagate it, though? Uh, I in, do. In all fairness, I you do. do. Yes. Really. Oh, yes. Wouldn't grassroots yeah, be we're... stronger for the culture itself? Because I, I would argue that culture shapes politics, not the reverse. Or you know, it does to some degree. But if you change mm -hmm. the culture that this is the accepted cultural interaction, you're going to shift the government automatically, in my opinion. But I, I could be wrong. I think I think so. But there, there's other inroads, too. So we're developing this course for people to use it, learn it and use it in their own daily lives. So that's sort of the ground up grassroots thing. But we've sent people who know street epistemology to a business. We've, we've done this once and we can replicate it. They wanted to bring us in there, in there to teach their employees how to have better conversations. Now, I would say that that's like maybe mid tier. It's not government, but it's maybe mid or even high, especially if it's especially if we're teaching the executives and the managers and that type of thing. That, that might be one way that we can propagate it downwards, right? So we're, we're coming on site, we're teaching street epistemology to a room full of call center agents who learn it for having better conversations over the phone. And then they go home to their families and hopefully see the value in it and teach their kids and use it with their kids and so forth. So there might be some top down. I can see a hole um, in that though, that I hope you're not considering. Yeah. Especially when go you said um, call center, it triggered something in my brain. Back to the manipulation. Ah. Hey, you, you teach the technique, right? Now I am a marketing guru. I take your technique and I weaponize it, which it can be done. The technique does have that ability to weaponize it into a sales tool or something of that nature. And that would be my only worry is if you start to pollute the intent of it, which is to come to conclusions, get a clearer mindset of from where you're approaching a subject or idea, if you put it in the other hands, like a business, and they don't even necessarily mean to do this. Some of this is just a built-in bias. Like, okay, we paid for this guy. He brought him, you know, we brought him in. He's teaching a course. How do we profit? How do we make some money on this? And then we can just tweak it a little bit. And then they go home and they're tweaking it a little bit and using it to manipulate others. I don't know if you've considered it, that. We have. And I mean, that that concern has come up long before we ever started venturing into businesses too, just to be fair to business people. <laughs> um, yeah, I, people do worry if it could be leveraged. So I, I've even noticed this, even in my early days, 2013, 2014, I'm exploring somebody's quality of their reasoning, right? There's this moment of aporia where they're thinking about it. Like, I don't know if I could be so sure that that's true. It's really tempting to want to give them an alternate way of thinking about the world in that in that vulnerable moment that they're in. And it's kind of up to the practitioner to, I, I would advise them to hold back and give them the space to think it through and give them a way of contacting you afterwards if they're not a family or friend so that you can give them the space to process it. But it is, it is an opportunity to inject your ideology. Right, in and that we, sales environment, that would be the close. Sure. Now you right. close. <laughs> so you However, it perfectly. My answer though is, if if SE does indeed become ubiquitous, the person on the on the phone, hopefully, would be prepared for that type of thing and could actually return with questions in kind. And well, hold on a second. Now you're making a claim. What do you mean by uh, this product is actually better than the other one? Mm -hmm. Right. So we want to elevate all ships in this so that we're all kind of communicating better. And we're not just taking advantage of each other because we have this dynamic tool that's out there. 
which is, is a great goal. Um, and I, I hope you're able to achieve that. And you I just both. always worry about the other shoe <laughs> dropping. So I do. And, and we were getting feedback because people are as, as street epistemology is expanding outwards, it's expanding outwards beyond atheist circles and skeptic circles and the, even theistic circles who have been exposed to it. And there, there's, there's a fair number of theists who are drawn to it and they use it. Um, it's, um, it's broadening it out, even, even it's broadening out into activism of all sorts. So there are vegan activists who now use street epistemology tools to explore somebody's reasoning, why they eat meat, for example, mm -hmm. to help them perhaps realize that they're overconfident in their justifications for doing so. Um, that will probably always be the case that, that there will always be people who see the utility of it for their pet views and propagating it out. But what's interesting, what's happening is we're now seeing people who are much different than the predominantly maybe left-leaning practitioners of SE. I would say maybe it's 80, 20, as those numbers shift and we start seeing a balance of practitioners across ideological divides, we're, st we're getting pushback now from some people. So when people on the left see people on the right using street epistemology, we're seeing complaints about it. Wait oh, they're not doing minute, it right. <laughs> What's going minute. on here? <laughs> and I would encourage somebody like if you encounter somebody who you disagree with using SE, don't just brush them off. Don't or, and by all means, please don't just throw away the tools and be like, oh, I'm now seeing neo Nazis use street epistemology. It must be a tool of the alt right. Don't be so short sighted. Mm -hmm. The tool is independent of the of the of the claim holder who's wielding it. And I think the best counter to, to a street epistemologist or somebody using street epistemology is to use street epistemology in return. And eventually we'll get to the truth. That I think that is the ultimate goal, or at the very least a more rational world who's seeking the truth. That's a perfect point of conclusion. Anthony, oh. thank you so much. <laughs>